during the Chinese New Year break, I had some time to go and uh, do some, uh, I think do, uh, just first day only, after that. So I, I went to look for a picture of a cup bearer. So this is a cup bearer, as Nehemiah was. And he is the one, a trusted one, besides the king. And uh, he will be drinking before the king does. He'll be eating before the king does. And if you look at this picture, you see on his left hand is the cup. And he will sample the drink. And if he survives, the king will drink. Not bad. Uh, and likewise for food. And on his right hand is something like a fan. Okay. But you see on his left shoulder, there is this sash. Actually, it's like a towel. So, after the king dirties his mouth and lips up, he will take this and wipe. This is called first class service. <laughs> so you know how to serve me. Eh? Okay. No, but this this is uh, the picture of a cup bearer. When we last stop, chapter 7, we look at the, the returnees under Jerubabel. The names of all these people were listed and they were very, in fact, they were very much the same as what we read in Ezra chapter 2. Except for the last part of verse 73. Otherwise, exactly the same as in Israel. And so today, we move on to chapter 8, and I've given you the outline there, so you will need to try and hear what I say. So Father, we come to you once again, even as you recorded and you remember all the returnees under Zerubbabel. Lord, I know, remember all these people who returned after the Chinese New Year break. And so as we come before you, Father, once again, pour upon us your truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, chapter 8. Now, after the walls have been built, rebuilt, that was the physical rebuilding. But actually more crucial and more important, more critical, is a spiritual rebuilding. And that is the word. No, no point having a, a, a structure, a building, but then spiritually, the, the, the identity of the Israelites, apart from the rest of the world, if there is no difference, spiritually, they must be different. And that is the uniqueness of the Jewish people in the world. They are religion. And so, the first the first thing that they, they turn back to was the word. And so we will see this in chapter 8. And in chapter 8, I've entitled it Fixing Broken Lives. Why? Because in the 70 years that they were out in captivity, in exile, they, they had no temple. There wasn't any worship. No, no celebration of feasts and so on. And no studying of the word. Though Israel, when he was up there in Babylon, he started the synagogues and so on. But this was in patches. It's not like he did it nationwide. So many people lack in the knowledge of the word. And so now that they are back and the wall has been rebuilt, it is time to return to the word. So, verse 1 to 8, we will look at the reading and the retaining of the word. And then, verse 9 to 12, how they respond to the word. And then, the third one, third part, it's implementation of the word. Verse 13 to 18. And that is important. Because even as we come to church every Sunday and we receive and receive, but if there is no application, then the word is just year in, year out. And that's why every Friday when we have the word at, at, the, at the end of the word that we have got application. So how do you apply the word? So, let's proceed. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man. That talks about unity. 
okay, as one group of people in the open square that was in front of the water gate. That was in front of the water gate. If you remember when we did chapter 3, the construction of the wall, it started with a ship gate, then it went anti clockwise. And then when they came to the water gate, was there any repair done to the water gate? Was there any repair done? No. The water gate is a picture of the Word of God. And the Word of God need no, needs no repair. The Word of God, Jesus is the Word. It is the same yesterday, today and forever. And His Word is yes and amen. The water gate does not need any repair. And where else would be the best place to do the study, to return to the Word of God? But at the water gate. And that's where they were. And I'm so tempted to call this uh, Bible study uh, the water gate. You know, that people think so scandalous, like President Nixon's time. But this is the water gate. This is where we study the Word of God. And they were there. They were hungry for the Word of God. And it was important now to build the spiritual wall. And this spiritual wall will separate them from the world. You understand? Because if the believer and the non-believer has got no difference in their uh, values, in, in, in the things that they believe in the foundation, then what is the difference? But it is because we have the Word of God as our foundation. And that is the wall, the spiritual wall that separates us from the world. And they told Israel, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. Now at that point in time, which book do you think this is? Book of the law of Moses. Is it the Bible? No, the Bible was not written yet. This was the Pentateuch. Penta, Penta means five. These are the first five books of the Bible, written by who? Moses. Moses. So brought this book before them for him to read. And the people need, needed to be reminded of all that God had commanded in the first five books. Verse 2, So Israel, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. You look, brought before the assembly of men and women. Some places they say, or oh, men go to church, women stay at home. Or oh, men go to worship, women stay at home. But you find here assembly of men and women. And those who could understand, and those and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Now that means those who could not understand, they were separated. And who were the ones who could not understand? The little ones, the children. And they did not understand. They probably run around and, 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 and whatever, make noise and so on. But this was the occasion for the study of the word. So those who could understand. So back in those days, I believe they must have got nursery. Uh, nursery and put them uh, separately. They are ministered separately. But those who could understand, men and women, they come together for Bible study. On the first day of the seventh month. Now I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more about the seventh month later. Because in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, they have got three holy days. And as they study the word, then they were reminded of the holy feast that God had commanded for the seventh month. So this is the first day of, of the seventh month. And this was September, October. Their first month is the month of Nisan. And that was in our, according to our calendar, is March, April. So if you go on to the seventh month, it's like September, October. Our September, October. 
Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday. Now, their morning starts very early. What time do you think is their morning? What time? Four. No, I'm not so. Six a.m. Six a.m. to midday is about six hours, right? Twelve noon. So this Bible study two hours are very short. Okay. So he read from it from morning till midday, about six hours. Before the men and women and those who could understand. And the years of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The priest's responsibility, Israel's responsibility was to what? Read. The people's responsibility was to be attentive. That's it. There is nothing Israel could have done. There is nothing I could do or any pastor can do besides just releasing the word. But I cannot tell you, hey, wake up, pay attention, don't play with your handphone, don't this and that and so on. That responsibility is the obligation. Okay. And also they were hungry for the word. Why? As I mentioned earlier, for, for 70 years, they have not had the word. Now they are hearing it, and so they were attentive. So, Israel, the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they made for the purpose. And this is about the first mention of a pulpit. Pulpit. And he stood on a platform made of wood, which they had made for the purpose. For the purpose of him to read the word. So the Old Testament says like, the preacher stood. But I prefer the Jesus method. You know Jesus? He sat on the people's foot up. Okay, never mind. And beside him, at the at his right hand stood Mati Haya, Shima, Anna Aya, Uriah, Hilkaya, and Masi Aya. And at his left hand, Peter Aya, Michelle, Malkija, Hashu, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Mashulam. All in all, 13. Some on his left, some on his right. And these were the leaders. In our church, we call them Oikos leaders, right? And Israel opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Israel blessed the Lord, the great God. And when he opened the book, all the people stood up. That was the respect they gave to the word of God. But I see some people, the way they treat their Bible, they throw on the floor, collect dust from the shelf, you know, they stand on it, they sit on it, they put it to prop up something. Uh, you, you know, it's the word of God. You understand? We, we seem to take it like a collection, like it's another book. But if I bring it to the underground church in China, some places, they would scramble for even one page of the Bible. Many places, they don't get to have a Bible. So, whoever has the Bible, the rest when they come, they copy manually, page by page, the Bible. And they treasure it. If you can give them one Bible, they will really, really treasure it. So, let's, like these people, show respect for the Word of God. And Israel blessed the Lord, the great God. So, the praise went before the studying, the reading of the Okay, praising God first. Then all the people answered, Amen. Amen. Amen means what? So be it. Then all the people answered, loud, Amen. Amen. While lifting up their hands. 
So even back in the Old Testament, there was lifting up of hands. But some churches today, if you lift up hands, they lift you out of the church. Okay? It happens. You don't believe me, ask Pastor Dave. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Hey, I don't see you all do that on Sunday. Eh? <laughs> you are not so pious. Eh? But that was reverence. They bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And there are some more helpers. And Joshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Khadijah, Masha'iah, Kelita, Azariah, Josabeth, Hanan, Pelaiah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law. So the people stood in their place. What did these leaders do? They helped the people to understand the law. The Bible did not say, interpret but explain. But today we have got lots of uh, debate and conflicts and within the church, different uh, denomination. You know why? Your interpretation is different from our interpretation. Nobody asks you to interpret. Oh, we want to interpret according to today's context. That was written thousands of years ago. Today's context is a bit different. So let me interpret for you. There is nothing for you to interpret. Your job is just to explain. So, they read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave sense, the sense, and helped them to understand the reading. They, you notice this day? So it's not just Israel. Israel was up at the pulpit and he read. But you see, all these people, they came back together after 70 years, right? And they came from all over. And while they were in Babylon and, and, and elsewhere, uh, they have adopted other practices. But more glaringly, as you read later on, we go to Nehemiah chapter 13. Some of them, their children especially, they, they took on a different language of the land up there. And they even forgotten their Hebrew language. And that is sad. But today, today if you go to Israel, they are still speaking Hebrew, the language thousands of years ago since they, they, they did Hanukkah now. And so because these people came together from different places and so on, and they have, uh, have different dialects, so they need someone to explain to them. So these helpers stood within their midst and explained to them. Some Bible, no, some, some, books, they, they, they say this is the Nehemiah method because you know why? This was mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. But more accurately, it is the Israel method, not the Nehemiah method. So the Israel method of Bible study is the verse by verse study. The Israel method is the reading and the explaining. And this is something which I embrace. This is something that you have been uh, following my ministry and so on. This is something I've been doing. I've been teaching. And I've been explaining. Because if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. And I know how you feel uh, because I felt the same way some 25 over years ago as a young believer. I opened the Bible and I read. And I didn't understand. Maybe a few verses here and there, but when they go into some other uh, Old Testament, the construction of this and the worship and then the, the manner, I don't understand. I don't understand the culture, I don't understand the history, the practices. And so I, I've got to learn. And when I learn, I then decide, decided and is prompted by the Lord to go and teach. So it is the reading and the explaining, so you understand. But some preachers, maybe they have a different ministry, I don't know. But they pluck a verse from this book, that book, this chapter, that chapter. And as David Paulson said, a text out of context uh, is a pretext. But you just choose a verse to suit the occasion, but you are not reading it in the full context. 
and you are not helping the people to understand. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and you use it for all occasion. So, if your cat got run over the car, you, oh, I can do all things through Christ, you lift up the car. Is it? No. That verse relates to financial matters, not any other. I, I stand at the door and knock and he opens and I, Jesus will go in and sup with you. And a lot of preachers use it for salvation, for evangelism. It is not. Because Jesus was talking to a church, to a church that is down. Okay? So, but that is, that is the purpose of studying the Word of God. Verse by verse, yeah, and then reading and then explaining so that the people know. But your job is not just to receive. Your job is to apply, and then your job is to go and teach others in your cell group, in your different ministry, children's ministry, whatever. Go and share. And that's it. Keeping it so simple. They gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. That's all. You know? Well, of course, some people like to add uh, illustration, which is good. Some people like to add jokes, which is also good. You know? Then they tell story, then they take newspaper cutting, and after a while, seems like the whole sermon is about the newspaper event, about the global event, about the financial crisis, about so many other things. But then the scripture comes in just to, you know what, support whatever he wanted to talk. It shouldn't be. Your main menu, your main course should be the word of God. Then your supplementary is all the other illustration that you want to add. Okay, so verse 1 to 8, as we have just covered, it is the reading and the retaining the word. They read and helping, and how to help them to retain the word? Explain to them. Now, verse 9. Verse 9 to verse 12. Response to the word. So, how was their response? And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Israel the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people <coughs> Levites uh, from there came the priests right we are all priests uh. so we also have a teaching ministry but maybe not all at the pulpit but wherever you are teach your children teach your family and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for the people, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. How come they were crying? How come they were crying? Because when you go through the word, the word goes through you. And then you get convicted. I have done wrong. I have missed the feast. I have not obeyed the word of God. You follow me? You, you feel that, you know, this is my life manual. This is the compass. And I've been going in the wrong direction. And so, all the people wept. Yes, it is repentance and so on. But what they were told by me, my Israel, and the Levites, this day is holy to the Lord. You should rejoice. Why? Because this is the occasion when you renew your relationship with God and it should be joyful. If you stay where you are, you should continue to be in sorrow because you did not repent. But the fact that you repent, the fact that you repent, this should be the day of joy. So, then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow. And this verse, we all know so well. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. But in verse 10, go your way, eat the fat, Drink the sweet and send portions to those who nothing is prepared. This is a time for celebration. This is the time for feasting. Because you know why? There is joy in the house. 
we have rediscovered the word. So your response to the word is joy. God forbid that when the word is released, uh, you come for the 9.30 service, then the, uh, the, after the worship, the word is released, uh, and then at 11.30 when you leave the church, and you leave worse than when you first came in. Is that how you, is that what you want, why you come to church for? 9.30 you came in, you, you're okay, you feel great on top of the world. Oh, 11.30 you want to crawl out of the church and go in the night when you feel so lousy. That is not, there should be joy. Because you have received the manna, you have received the word of life. So, here there is mention of social gospel as well. Please go and do something. Not just for yourself, but go and bless others. Because there were some, he read, and sent portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. Not all could make it to that teaching session that day. Not all could congregate that day. Why? Because some could be mourning. Okay? Some could be, for some reason, they are not well, they are at home and so on. They are in a hospital. And we could not forget them, neglect them. So, please, as we celebrate here, please bring some for those for whom nothing is prepared. You follow me? Like I came this morning and I saw that uh, I think the social concern are out distributing some things, right? We are bringing it to those people who are a bit uh, helpless. They, they need some. They need some social gospel. And here. We have people to bring it to them. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow for the joy of the Lord. I underline in my Bible, of the Lord. Not the joy in the Lord. This is the joy of the Lord. Now, our joy is in the Lord. But in this instant, it is the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. And so, what do you understand of joy of the Lord? You turn to Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. Zephaniah 3 17. Zephaniah is after Habakkuk before Haggai. Zephaniah 3 17. And if you know your God, and what he is doing in your midst, huh? how can you not be joyful? So Zephaniah three seventeen, the Lord your God in your midst, he is there where two or more are gathered. There he is, right? The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. You are his child. When you are in His presence, He is so pleased, He is so glad, He is so happy. Just like Chinese New Year, we all gather back to our patriarchs and our matriarchs, right? Go back to our parents, grandparents and so on. You take family photo and then you see who are the happiest people. Oh, I look at the two centre one. The grandma, the grandpa. They are the happiest. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. His banner over me is love. And He's rejoicing over me. Yeah, and He's glad over me. So when all this over me is joy, how can I not be joyful? So, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's not your own. It is from Him. Philippians chapter 3 verse 1. Philippians 3 verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me, to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So, he repeat. But he says, it's okay, it's for your good. Then go on to Philippians. Philippians 4.4 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
again, I will say, rejoice. Okay? So, be joyful. Back to Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 11. So, the people quieted all the... No, so the Levites quieted all the people. So, they must be making a real wail in the morning, right? Actually, you go to the Middle East uh, when they cry quite loud. <laughs> it's their culture. So, quieted all the people say, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words of that were declared to them because they understood the words that were declared to them. Now, if I come to you with theology, with uh, eschatology, yeah, and humatology, angelology, and two hours later you leave this room and you did not understand the word, then will you be more or less joyful? Oh, I came out from this class, I didn't understand a single thing. <laughs> Maybe when you were in sector three, sector four, you just want to get out of the class. Yeah. But we are now Great are you when you leave and you say, Wow, I heard, I understood, now I can apply. Then you leave the place joyful. And that's what they did. They rejoiced greatly because they understood the words that were declared. So that's why since the early days, uh, from this uh, master teacher I learned from John Carlong, he's he taught me one thing. Great teacher, if you get to see him and then learn from him and so on. I, I, I he has uh, gone to be where Jesus is. And he said, if the students did not understand, the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. Ring by one. If I just teach and I don't care whether they understand or not, I'm just doing a duty. I'm not doing a ministry. So if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. So whomever you are teaching, whenever you are doing your ministry, uh, take a bit more effort so that your students understand. Then you have done your part. Now we go on to verse 13. Now, as they read the word, study the word, they realize, hey, we'll be missing out on something. Now, if you go all the way back to Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23 describes the feast, the seven feasts for us. In the month, in the seventh month of the Jewish calendar, there are three feasts. And on the first day of the seventh month is the Feast of the Trumpets. The feast of the trumpets. You know, when they go to war, before they, they battle, they blow the trumpet and so on, right? Now, this was also the beginning of the civil year. Now, the religious year calendar is it starts in Nisan, in the month of Nisan, March, April. But the civil year, they have another calendar, civil year, civilian, you know, non, non religious, secular. That one starts in the seventh. But this was the trumpet to blow the, the starting of that civil year. So, on the first day of the seventh month, they have the Feast of the Trumpets. If you remember back in Leviticus 23, the Feast of the Trumpets point to what? Rapture. And then, you know, suddenly, yeah, it, suddenly uh, there will be a trumpet and then Jesus will come. I'm just making it very simple. Jesus will come in the, in, and meet us in the air. Those who are dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are, of us who are still alive will be caught up to meet Him yeah, in the air. And this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. So the Feast of the Trumpets point to the rapture. Now, so on the first day, of the seventh month, this is the Feast of the Trumpets. Then, on the tenth day, 
of the seventh month. It is the day of atonement. Day of atonement. Day of atonement, the, the Hebrew uh, word for this day is Yom Kippur. You heard of this? Yes. Yom Kippur. That is the most holy day in the Jewish calendar. That is the day when there is, they're going to make sacrifices for the sin of the nation. The whole nation goes into repentance. So when they bring the sacrifice to the temple, they bring it to the high priest. And then, tell the high priest, this is my offering to the Lord. Okay? Seek God's forgiveness for <coughs> my sin and my family's sin. And so when the priest, high priest brings this into the most holy place, he is standing in the gap for the whole nation of Israel. Heavenly Father, please forgive all the people of Israel for their sins in the last 365 days. You understand? The last one year, all their sins, are God forgive them. Then he comes out and then the people for wow, we are free. Then they sin in another 365 days and then they come back next year with another sacrifice. God, please forgive them. You follow me? That is the most holy day. Your people. Y O M. Your Kippur is K I P P U R. Your Kippur. K I P P U R. Your Kippur. And uh, back in the 60s, I if I remember the year correctly, right? uh, that was the most holy day. And, and, and on those days, you know, whether it's trumpets or, or Yom Kippur and so on, they do not work, they rest. <coughs> But that was the, the day when the enemies around Israel, they attacked Israel in the Sixth Day War. And he looked on paper, and as the first few days happened, Israel lost so many people, lost their tanks, and so Looks like they were going to be overrun. But you know, God is their defender. You have to go to Israel. We, our first trip to Israel, we went to the army camp, and they explained, and they showed one. It's a miracle how the, the, our God have defended from them. And they turned the thing around. And, and all the six, all the enemies around them were defeated. And Israel survived until today. Okay? So, that is the second holy day in the seventh month. Then, that is the tenth day of the seventh month. The first day is the Feast of Trumpets. Tenth day is the, is the Day of Atonement. Then the 15th day of the 7th month, that is the Feast of the Tabernacles. And they will celebrate this feast for 8 days. What is the Feast of the Tabernacles which they celebrate from the 15th day of the 7th month? This is for the people of Israel to come and stay in booth. So for that, that week or so, they will not be staying in their homes, but they go out and they stay in booth, like tents, you understand? This is to remember their forefathers when they were in the desert for 40 years, where were they staying? They were staying in all these mobile homes, all these booths, in all these shelters, and how that God provided for them and, and preserved them over these 40 years. So, the Feast of the Tabernacles is for them to go into that situation and to remember with thanksgiving and gratefulness how God had provided for their forefathers in the 40 years. Follow me? And then they have got leaves and this, and then they will celebrate, of course, you know, like Singaporeans feasting, they will eat, but they celebrate. So this were the three feast in the seventh month. So with that, let's look at verse 13. Verse 13 to verse 18, as I showed to you on the slide, implementation of the word. What are they going to do about what they have heard? Now on the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people 
with the priests and Levites were gathered to Israel a scribe in order to understand the words of the law. The heads with the priests and the Levites. That means uh, leaders also need to do Bible study. No? Leaders also need to come and learn the word. By fine. Uh, on quite a few occasions when we have got Bible teachers and others who come to church and so on. Okay. The leaders no, no need to come because you all need it more than them. You understand? Everyone needs. Everyone needs. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths. Okay? These are like the tabernacles, right? The booths. During the feast of the seventh month. And this is a family affair. It's not just the men of the house. It's a family affair. They all go and stay. And you try and do this uh, once a year, you gather your family up, uh, okay? Seven months uh, is the first month. Uh, you're going to stay in the pasha out now, outside of uh, a toy, you know. No, no, no. I'm talking about this. <clears throat> During the feast of the seventh month, and they should announce and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the mountain and bring olive branches of oil trees, myrtle branches, palm branches, branches of leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. These are temporary dwellings. And that's what their forefathers used for their accommodation in the desert. Then the people went out and brought them and made themselves booths each one on the roof of his house or in their courtyards on the courts of the house of God and in the open square of the water gate and in the open square of the gate of Ephraim. So wherever they were, they could do it on top of their house or in the courtyards or in the, court of the, uh, in, in the courts of the house of God or in the open square where the water gate was or in the open gate of the gate of Ephraim. You remember when we did chapter 3, construction of the walls, and then in that chapter 3, there were only 10 gates mentioned, but I said there were two more gates. The 11th gate is this gate of Ephraim, which was not mentioned in the chapter 3. So, later when we go on to Nehemiah chapter 12, I will show you the 12th gate. Now, so this is the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths. For since the days of Joshua the son of Nun, until that day, the children of Israel had not done so. That must be a long time ago. Isn't it? Yeah? After Moses was Joshua. No? And then from Joshua, they went into the promised land and so on. And from then until now, they had not done so. They have neglected this. And so now, they responded to the word in obedience. Not only in heart, but also in action. And so they did it the implementation of the word. And there was very great gladness. When you obey the word of God, there is gladness. Guaranteed. When you disobey the word, then you have, you know, a guilty conscience. The Holy Spirit is talking to you. And there was very great gladness. Also, day by day, from the first day until the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly according to the prescribed manner. And on the eighth day, there was a sacred assembly 
according to the prescribed manner. And all the other details that is this uh, prescribed manner is what well. you can read all this in Leviticus 23. Describe for us the feast of the tabernacles. Okay? That's chapter 8.